Good morning. It has been an awesome week of controlled chaos all week long. And I'll tell you, we filled this auditorium to capacity and then some, and over at the Olive Drive campus in Mount Vernon, and God brought a great harvest of souls. And so I want to say thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for serving the Lord. Thank you for giving to the Lord. Thank you for being a part of a church that is committed to sharing the gospel with the city of Bakersfield. And I'll tell you, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Well, it is uh, exciting to be able to be here today as we worship together and as we study God's Word together. We want to welcome you and those joining at Olive Drive. And if you have your Bibles, open them to James chapter 3. We're going to continue our study of James. Now, James is about faith that works, that genuine saving faith produces real works within our life. In other words, you cannot meet the living God. You cannot meet the Lord Jesus Christ and stay the same way that you are. If there is no change, James says, your faith is fake. And so what James' solution to that is get the real deal. Come to the Lord in genuine trust and faith and allow him to change your heart and to change your life. Now James, in chapter 3, begins by addressing the power of our spoken words. He addresses how our faith in the Lord, our relationship with God, affects the way that we speak. You remember when you were a kid and you said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Now, of all the lies we told as children, that's got to be one of the dumbest. You know? Usually we would say that when someone called us a name and it hurt real bad or they put us down, but we didn't want them to know how deeply it hurt. Many of us have had broken bones that soon mended. But wounds from words often linger longer. Words can be used to tear down or they can be used to build up. And so James is addressing the awesome power of our spoken words. Let's look what he says at. Uh, says in verse number one, my brethren, let us, not many of us or many of you, become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Our words are powerful to instruct. Now the context of what James is talking about is our teaching can lead to a dead faith that's no faith at all, or it can lead to a living faith that can save and transform. James is saying, if you're going to be a teacher, recognize that life and death are at stake. Make sure that your teaching is not teaching a dead, lifeless faith, but that you are teaching the Word of God and the gospel of Christ, and that you are teaching a living and vibrant faith. Now, James is not saying that no Christian should be a teacher. James is warning us not to accept the responsibility of teaching quickly because uh, our teaching has such positive and negative power. It has the power to heal or the power to wound. Our words have the power power to save or the power to destroy. Now, teaching can do so much good, especially if we're teaching the gospel especially if we're teaching God's Word. But James says, don't just teach to teach. Do it because God has gifted you to teach, and do it because God has put a message in your heart that you are compelled to share. Make sure that your instruction is in conformity to the living faith that we find in the gospel. Look what he says in verse 2. He says, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, 
He's a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Words are powerful to instruct, but they're also powerful to direct our heart and to shape our world. James says like a small bit in a horse's mouth. You have this powerful animal that is steered and controlled by a very small piece of metal. Or he says like a small rudder in a giant ship. You have this massive mountain of a ship that is steered and controlled by a very small rudder. James says our tongue is so small. And yes, it has tremendous power to steer us in one direction or another. It has the ability to direct our very heart. Now, Jesus told us that our words reflect our heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and that's true. But James is saying there's another side to that coin. Not only do our words reflect our heart, our words can also direct our heart. Like a bit in a horse's mouth or like a rudder of a ship, our words can direct our heart. I mean, think about the power of certain words. I was wrong. I have sinned. I am sorry. Think about the power of not my will, but your will be done, God. Think about I surrender all. Those are powerful words that can change the condition of our heart and set our life down a new path and give us new direction within our life. Now in the Bible, we see that God creates and relates to his creation and his creatures with words or by his word. And we also see that those of us that have been created in the image of God, that we exercise the dominion that he has given us with our words and through our words. Our words create our world. If you want the world of your mental life to change, then you need the words of your mental life to change. If you want the world of your marriage to change, then you need the words that you use in your marriage to change. If you want the world of your children to change, then the words you use to speak to them and the words that you teach to them need to change. And it's the same in our relationship with God or our relationship with the church or our relationship with other people. If we want our world to change then we need our words to change. Now suppose that you're really mad at someone. They hurt you, they harmed you, and you have a reason to be upset. And instead of speaking evil about them or speaking evil to them, you choose to speak words of kindness to them, and you choose to speak words of kindness about them. You will soon find that those words of kindness begin to alter your thinking and to change your heart towards that person. In part, that's what Jesus was getting at when he says, pray for those who persecute you. How you speak to God about someone else shapes your mind and your heart towards that other person person. That's what James is saying. He's saying your words have the power to direct your world, your relationships, and the way that you live your life. Now, when I am counseling a couple whose marriage is broken and they're struggling and they're hurting, one of the first things that I often say to them is that they, they need to start saying kind words to one another once again. I mean, that's, that's what happened when they got married. That's why they got married. They were kind to one another. They spoke words of encouragement and edification and, and love, and they were gracious to one another. And somewhere along the line, their heart got bitter. Their heart 
became broken and they started speaking words of hurt and harm to one another. And so I was like, you need to go back to the way you communicated when you first met and those words that you begin to speak will begin to change and transform your relationship. I mean, if you are married, then just speak those three magic words that warm the heart of your spouse. Let's eat out. I mean, it works. You'll see your world changes suddenly before you. <laughs> no, no, no. Speak those, <laughs> those three magic words. I love you. You are wonderful. You look nice. I am sorry. And pretty soon, as you begin to learn to control your speech then that begins to control your behavior. And like a rudder on a ship or a bit on a horse, it begins to direct your heart and to shape your world. But notice what he says in verse number 5. He says, Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. James says our our words are able to give life and vitality, but also our words are powerful to destroy ourselves and others. He compares our words to a wildfire. He says our words can, can spread like fire and cause destruction. Now, we have all seen the destructive wildfires here in California. And some of those have begun because someone carelessly threw a cigarette out the window and they went away and they have no idea the destruction and the devastation that they caused and left behind them. And there are times in our life where we can speak a careless word and we can leave and have no idea the devastation and the destruction and the damage that we leave behind. I've talked to old men and old women who still feel the pain of a careless word that a father or a mother spoke to them when they were young. That parent uh, uh, has long forgotten what they said, but it began to shape that child and how they view themselves and how they live and their, their worldview. You can do so much damage with your words, James said. Now, one of the ways that we destroy our relationship with God and we destroy our relationship with one another is by boasting. When you do something, it's really hard not to brag about it. I mean, if you don't believe me, guys, if you've ever done anything around the house, try doing that without telling your wife what you did. Sometimes when I do something, I I want my wife to know, hey, I I cleaned the dishes and I did this and I did that. And and, uh, isn't that great? Now, if it's out of love and you're trying to express love, that's a wonderful thing. But don't be going around bragging how spiritual you are. Don't boast about how holy you are because that turns the world off. And by the way, you are not holy, but our Savior is holy. It's not about how good we are. It's about how good God is. And and so don't be like the Pharisee who went in the temple to pray and he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like this guy over here. I'm much better than he is. Don't go around trying to boost yourself up. If God wants you to be exalted, he will exalt you. But don't try to exalt yourself. The Bible says God uh, resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Make the decision in your heart that you're going to have a humble heart and not a prideful heart. But not only boasting produces destruction, but also malicious gossip is a destructive form of speech. Now, what is gossip? 
Gossip is confessing other people's sins. Now, we need to confess our own sins, and that's a wonderful thing. If we confess it to those in the right sphere and so forth, and, and, and God uses that to help us grow. But gossip is when we think it's our job to confess everybody else's sins. And confessing other people's sins leads to pride. But confessing our own sins leads to humility. Let me ask you, what kind of heart do you want to have? What kind of person do you want to be? Do you want to be a prideful person or do you want to be a humble person? Gossip is sharing any problem of someone else that the act of sharing it is not a part of the solution to that person's problem. Gossip is absolutely destructive. Listen to what it says in Proverbs chapter 26 And verse 20, it says, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no gossip, strife ceases. James says, our gossip or our words can be like a fire that sets the whole forest ablaze. And so often, as we start this fire, it has unintended consequences. It goes further than we intended. It produces greater destruction than we ever thought it would. And Proverbs says, where there's no fire, uh, where there's no wood, the fire goes out. And where there's no gossip, the conflict ceases. Now, not only is there gossip and boasting, but there also is slander. Slander is reputation destruction. Right? It's where we're amplifying the imperfections and the weaknesses of, uh, of other people. We want to make sure everyone knows what's wrong with them. Man, that, isn't, isn't that a good guy? Well, I don't know. Did you hear about what he did five years ago? Well, doesn't he, doesn't he love the Lord or she loved the Lord? Well, I don't know. They walked past me and didn't say hi the other day. I don't know what's going on. It's probably not good. Slander is trying to make other people look bad in the eyes of someone else. And gossip and slander is satanic. Did you know that the word Satan means accuser? The Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He stands before God and accuses us. And Jesus stands as our advocate before God. He says, paid in full. Paid in full. And so he overcomes the accusations of Satan. But but when we gossip and when we slander, we become little Satans. We become little accusers of the brethren. And let me tell you, Satan's already doing enough destruction. He doesn't need your help. He doesn't need you to join him in his task of trying to overcome the work of God and destroy the people of God. That becomes us when we gossip. The Bible says that one of the things that God hates is one who sows discord among the brethren. And when you and I slander, when you and I gossip, when you and I put other people down, that becomes us. How beautiful it is for the brethren to dwell in unity. How destructive it is for one to sow discord among brothers. Now, James is telling us that our words can be evil. This word evil has the idea of doing harm. Uh, and, and causing pain and hurting uh, someone else. And, and when we see someone who's evil, it's someone who, who just really wants to, to hurt other people. And when we speak evil, James says we are committing evil. That is why when our words devolve, our world itself devolves. When the words of your marriage devolve, the marriage itself devolves with it. When the words of your home devolve, then your home itself devolves. When the words of a church devolve, then the church itself begins to devolve. When 
our words in our walk with God begin to devolve, then our relationship with God itself devolves as well. James says our words can be like a wild beast, but worst. He says a wild beast, all of them at one point have been tamed by man, but no man has ever tamed the tongue. No one has learned how to completely control their mouth. And that's true for all of us, isn't it? James says that our words also can be like a poison. Did you know that Poison is deliberate, but it also is deceptive. Just a small amount of poison in the food can blend in with the food and deliver a fatal blow. It works secretly, but it also works deliberately. And a malicious person can work just a small amount of poison into the conversation, just a sly remark, just a little phrase, just a little thing said here and there, and its effects can be harmful and devastating. Now, you and I would never think about releasing a wild animal or a poisonous snake into someone else's life. But James says that's exactly what we do when we speak hurtful and harmful words to one another. Notice what he says in verse number 9. With it, that's with our tongue, we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude or the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. James says our words have the power to bless or to curse. Now, when he talks about cursing, he's not talking about Uh, our use of curse words. It's something greater and larger than that. There are some religious people who would never think of using a curse word, but they'll demean you and belittle you all day long. And so what James is, is pointing out is he's saying when you devalue someone else with your words who bears the image of God you are at the same time devaluing the God whose image they bear. You cannot devalue another human being without devaluing their creator who created them with his image. Now that image has been tainted by sin, but it's still there. That's the sanctity of personhood that God has given to each and every person. And James says, when we bless God and we curse man, we devalue them and we put them down, he says, something is wrong within our heart. And then he goes on to say that our words are powerful to reveal the nature of our heart. You see, you don't have to wonder what is going on in your heart because your words reveal your heart. Like the water of a spring revealed a spring, your words reveal your heart. Words are powerful because they're our heart telling someone else's heart, this is what I think of you. And sometimes we're too cowardly to say, I don't love that person. So we just cut them down and put them down with our words. And James is saying that our evil words are an indication of an evil heart. He says the type of water reveals the nature of the spring. The, the, the type of fruit reveals the nature of the tree. And James is saying our words reveal the nature of our heart. They reveal the progress of our faith. They reveal to us what is going on in terms of our heart and our relationship with God. Now, sometimes you may say something horrible. And later you go, where did that come from? Well, the Bible tells us where it came from. It came from your heart. And and sometimes we don't know what's in our heart until it comes out. 
Now, God always knows, doesn't he? But we don't know until we say something and we go, whoa, what, what's going on there? What's going on there is something's wrong with your heart. Now, sometimes God knows what's in our heart, but we don't know. And so he allows trials and difficulties within our life. And, and, and uh, suddenly in those trials and difficulties, we realize that there's something wrong with our heart that we didn't know before. God knew, but he needed to show us so that we could deal with it. And so what happens when we say things that we didn't know were in our heart is our mouth is betraying our heart. We were trying to keep it in there and keep it secret, but our mouth always betrays our heart. There's been so many times I'll say something and I go, Whoop, I can't bring it back. Do you know that an angry heart speaks angry words? A bitter heart speaks bitter words. An evil heart speaks hurtful words. But the same is true when it comes to a heart that's been changed by Christ. A loving and kind and gracious heart speaks loving and kind and gracious words. Now, this morning, I want to give us several points of application as we look at this passage. First, Let's admit that we all have a real problem and repent. See, none of us is exempt from the message that James is sharing. In fact, in verse 2, he says, uh, anyone who can bridle the tongue is a perfect man. Well, we don't have any perfect people here today. And so all of us need this message. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, man, my husband really needs this message. And that's true, but so do you. Maybe you're thinking, well, my wife, boy, she really needs this message. And that's true, but you really need it too. All of us need this message. We need to admit we have a real problem with our words. And so if you use your words to dominate or to manipulate or to tear down, then this is an opportunity for us to confess that and to repent. It is an opportunity to recognize the harm and the hurt that our words have caused, the brokenness that they have brought into relationship with God and our relationship with other people, and to recognize that our evil words have revealed to us an evil heart. And what we need to do is to go to the Lord to give us a new heart. To say something's not right in my heart because of the words that I'm using and the things that I'm saying. God, would you give me a new heart? I want to challenge all of us here today to have an honest conversation with ourselves. And part of the reason for that is that we need to get to the point where we can trust ourselves. And we need to be honest with ourselves so that we can be honest with God. There, there are times where we tell ourselves we're going to do something and we don't do it, and so we don't trust ourselves anymore. There are times where we say things to ourselves that aren't true. I'm okay. You're not okay. My marriage is great. It's not great. It's not what it could be. I, I don't have a drinking problem. You've got a drinking problem. And, and so what, what happens is if we lie to ourselves enough, then we stop trusting ourselves, and that produces tremendous destruction. But most importantly, if we lie to ourselves, then we can't speak the truth to God. And if we're not honest with ourselves and we're not honest with God, then, then we can't have our life changed and transformed. And so some of us need to, to have an honest conversation with ourselves to say, I'm half the spouse that I ought to be. I'm half the parent that God's called me to be. I'm not the son or the daughter that God wants me to be. And that's a good conversation to have. You know why? Because now that we are honest with ourselves, we can start the process of repentance and allow God to begin to change our heart and transform our actions and change our life. And so first, we need to admit that we have a real problem and repent. Secondly, let's use our words for a positive purpose. Now, in the Bible, 
we all are called upon to repent, but then we also are always called upon to replace. If you repent, but you don't replace, then you're going to be miserable, bored, and boring. You know why? Because you don't have a purpose. Now, we should repent of sinful purposes, but then we should replace that with the power of a positive purpose, that we would honor God with our speech and with our words, that we would speak words of love and kindness and grace to other people. Instead of tearing people down, we're committed to building them up. That we commit to our words being true and kind and loving and imparting grace to other people. Instead of spewing envy or jealousy or gossip, when we see something good happen to someone else, we say, I'm going to celebrate when they win. I'm going to rejoice with those who rejoice. You know why? Because that shows that in our heart that there's love for that person. When your children win, you celebrate. You know why? Because you love them. If we're not celebrating when other people win, it's because there's, there's love lacking within our heart. And so we need to repent, but then we need to replace. Now, it's possible, and maybe some of us in this room, your spouse and kids wonder if they ever do anything right because you are so great at pointing out everything that they do wrong. Let me give all of us a goal for this week. This week, your goal and my goal is to catch someone doing something right and then celebrate with them. To catch someone doing something good and encourage them and to point out uh, God's grace within their life. Love is always saying and speaking God's grace to other people and always celebrating what God is doing in someone else's life. There are people in your life that need you to speak life into them. They need to hear you say, I love you. I'm proud of you. You are a blessing to me. You mean so much to me. They need to hear you say, Jesus loves you, and so do I. Third, let's learn to think and to speak God's word. Now, our vocabulary creates and shapes the way that we think, the way that we speak, and the way that we live. When I learn a new word or a, a new vocabulary, then it opens up a world of ideas to me. And it, and it gives me a whole new way of thinking and a whole new way of uh, perceiving and a whole new way of living. And so we need to learn a new vocabulary. We need to learn God's vocabulary. We need a new way to think to ourselves and to speak to others. And it's all right here. Let's think the thoughts of God and speak the words of God, and watch God direct our heart and shape our world. Now, when James says tongue, he's talking about our language. Well, how do you learn a new language? Well, they say the best way to learn a new language is language immersion. You immerse yourself in that new language where uh, everything you think and everything you say is in the language that you're trying to learn. Well, how do we learn a godly and Christ-like language? God's language immersion. We immerse ourselves in the Word of God. We get into the Word of God until the Word of God gets into you. And so when you come to God's Word, pray, God, give me an open heart. Speak to me. Help me to be receptive. And you stay in God's Word until God's Word begins to get into you and be transformed and renewed by the Word of God so that your words reflect God's words because your heart reflects God's heart. Fourth, let's give the Holy Spirit control of our words. Now, did you know that with our words, we can resist the Holy Spirit we can grieve the Holy Spirit, 
We can quench the Holy Spirit or we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We resist the Holy Spirit when we refuse to repent. We resist the Holy Spirit when we say, I'm just going to keep talking the way I talk and say the things that I say, and I'm just going to keep my heart where it's at, and I'm not going to change. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we use our words to hurt and to harm other people. The Holy Spirit is grieved by our words, but also we can quench the Holy Spirit by not allowing His power to work through us to do the right things. You are quenching the Holy Spirit by not being encouraging to your wife and your kids. I tell you, God used my wife one time to really open up my my mind to this idea. One time she says, Matt, she says, grace is truth. Love is truth. Gentleness is truth. Meekness is truth. And so it's not enough that we just repent. It's that we must allow the power of the Holy Spirit to work through us to have a positive impact. Some of us are quenching the Holy Spirit because we're not allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to work through us to share the gospel with our family and our friends and those that we love. But then finally we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we are filled with the Holy Spirit when we allow the Holy Spirit to control our words. Let's give them control. Let's let the Holy Spirit lead us, guide us, and empower us in what we say. You see, we know that we need the help of the Holy Spirit. James says no one can control the tongue. You can't do it on your own. This is not a grab a root and growl message. This is a surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit message. You can't do it on your own. We need God to change our heart. To ask regularly for the Holy Spirit to help us to control our speech. You know, it's an amazing thing what God can do when we commit our speech to Him. Now, before we receive the help of the Holy Spirit, we must first by faith put our trust and our faith in Jesus as our Savior and to commit to following Him as our Lord. And so this morning, if you have never trusted that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, that He he rose from the dead, that He's coming again to rule and to reign, we invite you this morning to give your sin and to give yourself to Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for us. And when we give our sin to Him, when we come to Him for forgiveness, then He forgives our sin and we are given the righteousness of Jesus. But also, when we come to Jesus in genuine faith, there's repentance. There's a desire to turn from sin and to follow Jesus as Lord. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We want to invite you today to trust and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if you do, you will find that Jesus is an all-sufficient Savior and He is an all-loving Master. Let's bow together in an attitude of prayer. Here in a few moments, we're going to have a time of invitation. And as we worship, as we sing, and as we stand, there will be pastors here at the front and counselors. We want to invite you to come and to give your life to Jesus. To say, I need a new heart. I need my sins forgiven. I need redemption and salvation and a relationship with God. And if you'll put your trust in Jesus, he'll give you all of those things. Maybe this morning you say, I've put my trust in Jesus, but I've never personally and publicly professed my faith in Jesus through baptism. And when you get baptized, you're saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto my salvation. It is the declaration of your faith in Jesus. And 
You can come forward. We'd love to talk to you about that and set up a time where you can profess your faith in Christ through baptism. Maybe the Lord is leading you to join this church. You say, I need a spiritual family. I need a faith army. I need a band of brothers and sisters. And side by side, we can follow Jesus together. I need some people who love me and love Jesus. And together, we can follow Jesus the way that God designed us to do. Will you come forward this morning and say, I'd like to join this church. I want to be a part of this. I want to grow here. I want to grow in my faith. I want to grow in my love. I want to grow in my obedience. And I want to use my gifts to further the kingdom and the glory of God. You come forward and make that decision. But maybe you're here this morning and the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. In fact, James says that this message is for all of us. And so maybe there's some words that you have spoken that have done harm. Maybe they've caused a broken relationship. Maybe instead of speaking the word of God to yourself, you're speaking lies to yourself. Maybe you need to have an honest conversation with God. This is an opportunity for us to bring our hearts and our words to God and say, God, would you give me a new heart? And would you give me the power to control my tongue? Give me a new vocabulary. Give me a new ideas. Give me a new life and a new way to speak. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word. We're thankful, Lord, that your word reveals our heart. And God, I pray that if there's anything in our heart that is hindering our fellowship with you, that you would show us, that the Holy Spirit would convict us, and God, that we would not only repent, but we would also replace with that which is loving and good and kind and Christ-like. Father, I pray that our words would be marked by the fruit of the Holy Spirit, that we would not quench the Holy Spirit, but allow his power to transform our tongues. And God, we pray that our words would say your praise and your glory and your grace. God, I pray for Valley Baptist Church that we would be a, pray, a place of constant edification and encouragement. A place where the down and the broken and the battered and the hurt and the sinful and the sufferer can come and hear words of life that bring life and transformation. God, may we be a people whose words reflect the heart of Christ. Work in this invitation. God, may we not leave the same as we came. May we know you and enjoy you more. May we love you more. May we trust you more. May we obey you more. And may we surrender all to following after you. If there's anyone here that doesn't know Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that you would open their heart, open their life. And they would see the beauty of your grace. Christ. Bless this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.